Well, hello everybody. Um, on, you're very welcome to uh, our third Pathways session uh, on such a beautiful, beautiful spring day here in Ireland. Mm. Uh, I hope the sun is shining wherever you are. Uh, it's it's <laughs> five past here now. I love these um, opening moments on a, on a Zoom when we all filter in. Uh, will we get going, Carl? I will just start. Yeah, Dave, yeah, David that's fine. Okay, I'll just start. So um, uh, you're all very, very welcome uh, for this, our um, third Pathways uh, webinar of 2022. Um, uh, unlike the first two that were workshop-based, this is a panel discussion, which I hope you will all um, participate in. It's wonderful to see so many of you from around the country. Um, we, we, the, the, the idea will be that I will, I will chat with our four esteemed guests for uh, an hour, and then we will have a half an hour when we will take questions from the floor. Please use the chat if, if you're inclined um, to, to uh, and if you wanna, if you, if you have anything to say to each other, or indeed to say to the guests, and we'll try and keep an eye on that. Um, this session is being recorded. Um, um, the recording is already on, so I hope that's okay with all of you. This will allow us to make it available to those festival makers who were not uh, able to attend. It will be put up on the, the Arts Council website on the Pathways page. Um, so, um, Carl, do you, I think Carl, Carl is traveling today. So he normally says something at this stage. He might wait until he's settled, or, or do you want to just come in and say hello, Carl? Just to just to say hello to everybody from Dublin, Connolly. I'm on the move, so <laughs> I'm sorry I can't, I can't uh, I can't be more stationary for this session. But I'm listening in and uh, really looking forward to it. And just to to welcome Emma, Beatrice, James, and Una today, and thank David for all his hard work. And I hope you find this session fruitful. <laughs> Thanks very much, everyone. Um, well, thank you indeed, Carl. Um, so I'd also like to, 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 before we start, I'd like to welcome, we have a number of arts officers in, in, in the room today. Um, uh, arts officers play a very important role, as we all know, in the festival ecology, um, supporting it in so many different ways. Um, and um, so it's great to have, have your presence here in the room uh, to listen to our conversation. Um, and, and hopefully um, to, to contribute to it. Um, but if not, we certainly um, rely on your contribution to festivals um, on an ongoing basis and, and recognize it. Um, so the Pathways um, program was established last year um, uh, as an ongoing response to COVID in some ways. Um, and we felt that it was important to continue it this year. Part of that was due to when I was traveling in August, September last year, um, I was astounded by the resilience of the festival organizations that I, I, I came across going to festivals uh, who did an extraordinary job, not just those why I went to, but by and large, we're aware of an extraordinary resilience in this sector um, and the innovation with which festivals um, undertook to sustain their work with artists and with public during the time of COVID. Um, but we were also became aware of a certain vulnerability in the sector in relation to, to um, uh, the sector, various different aspects of the sector. Among that, were the, the, the vulnerabilities were, were burnout among festival makers, was the difficulty in, in, in um, uh, retaining and, and, and uh, recruiting board members, and also with volunteers. Um, so to, to, to check on that, to confirm this or to hear about this, we had the Festival Makers Forum in the autumn and, and, and our suspicions were certainly confirmed by that. So the, 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 the webinar series has been an attempt to respond to that with different learnings. We started with scenario planning. Um, we then went on and did succession planning uh, in the two workshops. We're now moving to the panel discussions and today we're gonna to focus on different models of festival practice that are emerging. Um, that are helping to respond to uh, the changing nature of festival making and the changing nature of our society. Um, uh, so it's interesting that, you know, it is possible to sustain the, 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 the festival practice, as, as I know from my time there, has 
a demand in terms of programming, a demand in terms of the logistics and the delivery of that program, a demand in terms of the administration and maintaining the, the, the sort of fiscal rectitude that is required and also then in terms of marketing. So these were the kind of main areas I think festivals are involved in. But in recent years, there's been this increasing demand in relation to policy, whether it be health and safety or child protection, um, or paying the artists, and more recently, equality, diversity, and inclusion. And, and coming down the line, the likelihood that uh, econo ecological responsibility will become a further layer for us to, to, to be conscious of. So we are conscious within the Arts Council, particularly in a sector where there's a lot of voluntary uh, contribution. We are absolutely aware that that this is these, this is a huge demand, and we're, we're we're determined to, in whatever way we can, to support festivals so that um, this in incredibly important aspect of the cultural, economic, and and uh, life of of villages, towns, and cities across Ireland is sustained. Um, so. One of the things during COVID that um, I suppose uh, started to emerge in Ireland, and we will turn to that. I, I, I will introduce each of the guests um, in turn, um, but just to reiterate or to, to um, reiterate my thanks to the guests. I, I've had a the wonderful opportunity to have conversations with them over the last um, number of weeks in preparing for today. So we're joined today by, by two Irish uh, delegates or, or panelists and two international panelists. Our Irish panelists are uh, Emma Nee Halsam from the Burr Art Centre, who is involved with the Burr uh, Festival Consortium. Um, and um, in, in Mary O'Kennedy is was on, on a, who was scheduled to speak was unavailable today. So her colleague um, uh, uh, Una, um, her colleague uh, Una O'Donovan is joining us um, uh, from um, Mary O'Kennedy or O'Kennedy Consulting, um, who is going to speak on on sort of corporate partnerships and the way things are changing there. Uh, James McVeigh is joining us from. Edinburgh, uh, James, uh, an Irishman, uh, long, long been living in, in, in England, is a, a member of the festival's Edinburgh consortia. So we have two different consortia, one Irish and one international. And we're also joined early in the morning by uh, Be Be Beatrice Pizarro, who is a theatre maker and festival maker in Toronto. So we're going to start looking at um, the festival consortia idea which has emerged in Ireland in recent years, um, uh, certainly during COVID with the capacity building funding available, a number of consortia were established around the country where different festival organizations or sometimes festival organizations and non-festival organizations were looking to try and uh, respond to the demands of festival making to add to what they were doing in their local community uh, and help them to sustain their practice by, by coming together. Um, probably the, 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 in terms of the festival sector, the consortia that had a head start on this um, uh, idea was in Burr because the five festivals in Burr had come together uh, two or three years before COVID, so we're talking 2019, mm -hmm. I think, to, to start talking to each other. And so by the time the capacity building funding came in, um, these festivals were well on the way in terms of um, an idea as to what they're going to do. So um, Emma, would you like to share with us um, how this happened, how, why the festivals came together? Um, in, in, in Burr and mm -hmm. that process that led up to availing of the capacity building. Okay. Um, hi, Dermot. Uh, David, everybody. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. Um, and yes, so uh, I am MNE Haslam. I am the manager here at Burr Theatre and Arts Centre. Um, I have been here for the last 20 years and I've been involved in festivals in Burr since 1995. And when I was uh, making that note, I was, oh, that's a long time. <laughs> but anyway, the festivals in Burr exist for a long time. Um, you know, there are five in the Burr Festival Collective uh, made up of 50 
53 year old Borough Vintage Week and Arts Festival, which is a community arts festival. Hullabaloo is 16 years age. Um, that is a children's arts festival, a offline film festival, 13 years. Scripps Ireland's Playwriting Festival is going on nine years and Borough Festival of Music is going on six years. So as you can see, there's a there's a variety of art forms being celebrated, um, you know, through festival activity um, and obviously with festivals, we have uh, all similar challenges. Uh, so the main aim of the collective is to provide shared services and, and shared experience and, and uh, work uh, together um, as we deliver our festivals for the town. So I suppose, you know, yeah, you rightly pointed out that um, uh, we had come together probably in about 2016. Um, and, you know, what motivated, I suppose the question is what motivated us to come together in the first place? Um, and I suppose over the past two decades, um, a lot of the same people were involved in different festivals in one way or another in the town. So, you know, the collective probably existed informally already through um, maybe the central point of Borough Theatre and Arts Centre, where four of the five festivals incubated and developed from. Um, with the, the there was a mix and a crossover of individuals from the community involved in the various festivals and instinctively those individuals probably saw the merit in forming a collective we'd experience you know gained over the last number of decades and I suppose we were collaborating fairly naturally already just not being in any official capacity but we were still running our festivals quite individually uh, we had marketing needs we had admin needs we had funding you know volunteer needs and as you pointed out you know policies were developing and the you know it, it, we need support um and then I think we were all busy in our own little worlds and in our own little festivals. Um, and the main uh, challenge was to, um, in establishing a formal collective, was probably getting us all together. Um, I, that was certainly one of the, the biggest challenges was us all finding and allocating time to get together. And we probably needed, we, we certainly needed a, a little bit of support and a leg up in that regard. Um, and so this was, as you said, prior to the capacity building support scheme. Um, so Burr 2020 Vision Company was a, a, a voluntary organisation that was established in Burr just so Burr's voice could be heard after the abolishment of the town councils. So you're talking back maybe 2014, 2015. Um, and they listened to the festival um, and were aware, you know, they worked with the individual festivals and knew of our, all of our shared issues and uh, and, you know, saw that the importance of working together as well. So, um, you know, actually, you know, they, they, their chair, if I could just very briefly quote from his, um, his introduction in a report that we developed, you know, he, and he, I think it's key for today, considering the name of Stronger Together, Responding to Change. And he said, you know, the Burr Festivals separately and collectively are essential to the social and economic well-being of Burr and the surrounding region. And they provide occasions for celebration of our togetherness, for the sharing of that togetherness with others. And I, I just thought I really liked that. And I think it was poignant, you know, as we gathered together. Um, so the the they were instrumental in securing funding for us to commission um, research um, and ways of looking at recommending ways in which we could maximize our resources and opportunities uh, within our, you know, we already had the vibrant cultural environment. So uh, through Offaly Local Development Company, uh, Burr 2020 engaged uh, Dermot Medlockland to work with us. Um, and so the journey began and we worked on developing our festival development strategy. Um, and I'll put a link up to it actually uh, in the chat in a wee while. The right time to break now. Ah, okay, <laughs> yeah. okay, okay. That's the motivation so, so, behind us all. <laughs> very good, very good. So you had got to this point um, mm -hmm. where, where you had a strategy um, and, and, and you were working together collectively. So, uh, which I would have been aware of prior yeah. to COVID and then prior to capacity building funding. And then, um, I, I, as far as I can, I, I, I can collect, and you be a bit. Um, I, I gathered that when capacity building funding, the the collective were able to to apply for funding for the collective, mm -hmm. but that each of the individual organisations also applied for uh, uh, for um, uh, support. Some of which was to feed the collective as well. I'm thinking in terms of 
of the the tent, the 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 dome tents. Um, the dome tents, but that yes, actually. So for those that they, they, there was a. Um, uh, was that true? That was true collective. Yeah. And I suppose that was one of the big merits, you know, that came out was the um, that's not right. um was the um I suppose being together as a collective. So, you know, it provided us the, 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 just the huge job. We added weight to things that were, per, you know, worked on in the town. Uh, so, for example, the domes uh, are outdoor uh dome structures for outdoor performances um, and they uh, were purchased through supports from um, Bur Bur Municipal District um, but I think they saw that 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 grouping together of the festivals and that we were working together you know and and, and saw that the benefit of that so we we we, we added weight to that the purchase of that you know showing that well, we're going to use these for outdoor activities uh, there's other projects like the courthouse development in the town and the bird destination town so certainly the collective um and added weight to those projects that are currently in, in you know ongoing so in your in your convert so when when opportunities for funding became available, whether mm -hmm. through the Arts Council or others, you found that uh, having a collective uh, gave a greater weight to oh, the applications. Yeah. yeah, it certainly did. And you know, we we so we 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 were we existed as you pointed out before the capacity building support scheme came on board. And now we had only just about we were still working through our report and working through our you know what is going to be in our strategy, what is going to be in our plan. Um, however, when the capacity building support scheme came on, it was. Yeah, it was really, really, it was great timing because we were able to engage a project um, a project coordinator through Colin Croffey and then marketing services through uh, Tom Lawler and Rebecca Kelly. So, and they are working with the five festivals in mind, um, Colin, particularly in relation to a volunteer strategy, which is one of the main things that we, you know, really needs to work on. Um, business development, that sort of activity is what, what Colin would be working on with us. So I suppose that brings us nicely to, to um, uh, I suppose, the two sides of it. Um, firstly, the benefits you've mentioned in terms mm -hmm. of having um, you've, having that collect that weight when it came yeah. to and, and having a formal um, conver a formal structure for uh, talking to each other as, as being benefits. And mm -hmm. um, you've also been able to get this marketing support. How to date? I mean, it's relatively new. The, having the marketing support and having mm -hmm. the logistics support. Um, can you give us some idea of how that is going uh, um, uh, in terms of, and, and recognizing that that um, uh, we're, we're in a very, I, I would hope we're in a safe space where um, this is not a judgmental space. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the importance of learning here is about understanding not just the benefits of it, because we can see that, and that's why we invited you along, but also to see what are the difficulties and the, the challenges. Oh, uh, yeah. Face. Yeah, there certainly are. Look, there are certainly challenges. I mean, you know, there's, there's, the, there's the logistic challenges of, you know, um, right, we have a projects coordinator. But, you know, which of the five in the, the consortia are actually, you know, who, who's the boss? Who, who's, you know, or who's, who is responsible for communications with that person or, or what way that works so that's that's where the capacity building support scheme really benefited us because we're now able to trial options you know again one of the real positives of the collective is that we have a very open trusting relationship that has existed for years and probably because four of the festivals probably started within the theater so um, and that's not to say um, you know more festivals won't join in there's you know there's certainly if something else is established so there are five currently five festivals in the town so yeah there could be more established and would be expected to be part of the collective um by way of a, you know to, to answer the question i suppose with them um, where are the challenges with the current personnel we have there certainly would be across the board but um managing contracts would be certainly one of them that sort of thing Do you know and one of the other big ones column and i spoke about it the other day was 
the risk of excluding volunteers, you know, because now suddenly the community is looking in and seeing, oh, well, they're all working together. That's, you know, we don't want to certainly can't create this closed shop feeling or like we really need people. We need people to be involved in our festivals uh, because that is how they have, look at Borough Vintage Week is running for 53 years on complete, you know, a, a, a voluntary commitment. Um, and we certainly don't want a scenario where, you know, we, we do need, we need people still to be involved and not those that are responsibly shy, responsibility shy either. We certainly want to make sure that we get people with project management experience, with financial experience, with all those different um, things that every festival would need, you know, a visual arts experience, all of that. Um, so that certainly would be a challenge to make sure that the message going out to the public is right and that there is a, still a very wide open door um, and I think probably festivals that is one of the first the thing that we probably talked a lot about with Dermot was um, when he was gen, you know creating the strategy was how does a voluntary committee work who never who, who's always worked with that voluntary ethos suddenly work with an employee or somebody who falls into so yeah it is a challenge but the capacity building has allowed us um trial things see how that will work instead of going straight into a you know engaging and employing somebody and finding yourself caught within you know um employment contracts and all that sort of thing you know this this is a it's a real opportunity for us to to trial these great that, 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 that that's very interesting that that yeah. um intersection between the professional and the amateur yeah. and how, do you, how do you bring in um uh, because I did recognize in the beginning the importance of the voluntary sector, um, and, and I, which has been in festivals in Ireland oh. since, mm -hmm. since forever, um, and, and that, that it's, it's a very rich aspect of it and one mm. we hope will continue. Yeah. But how do you blend the two of them? So yeah. um, uh, that's, that's terrific, um, uh, Emma, and we will, we will swing back. Um, and I'm sure that people um, in the, that, that there are people here who have questions in relation to that. I would point out, something Carl reminded me to tell you is that capacity building funding is running once this year in Ireland. Um, and it's the, the closing date, I believe is the 11th of May. So uh, for those of you who are inspired and or interested in this consortia idea, um, and I'm sure Emma uh, is, uh, and, and her colleagues in, in Burr will, will um, uh, provide further information. And you said you'd share the- um, I think I'm going to share the report there now. I'm going to put a, 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 a link to that so people can download it and read it at your heart's content. <laughs> well, that's very generous and, and, and collegiate of you. And, and, no, and no problem. It's on, it's on our website, so there's no problem <laughs> at all. So if you miss it on, on the link, you can get it there. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, Emma. So we're going to now turn to a very similar um, uh, project of, uh, I suppose, in, in a different country and probably on a different scale, um, being that Edinburgh is a lot, much, much larger um, uh, urban conurbation to Burr. Uh, which has a very, very long and um, uh, uh, festival tradition, going back to um, after World War II when the uh, Edinburgh International Fest was set up. It's a place I know well, of visiting in August um, for the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and the International Festival, and seeing so many other festivals happening at the same time. Um, so in 2007, I believe the festival Festivals Edinburgh was set up as a, a consortium, so significantly longer. And I think this is why we wanted to bring James in was to talk about that, that, that consortia idea seen from a longer perspective. Um, and uh, it had one employee to, working two days a week in, in 2007. There is now a, a staff of six. Now taking into con consideration context of place and scale, um, it's still very impressive. So James, you're very welcome uh, uh, back to Ireland. Uh, and and um, so could you maybe give us a little synopsis of the sort of history and the general um, focus of Edinburgh's festival? Okay, uh, it's good to be here. Uh, my, my first festival actually went, was when I took a trip with the family of nine mm. uh, to the Bally Shannon Folk Festival. And because I was the smallest in the, in the family, they used to lie me across the back windscreen. Uh, and so my first vision of a festival was looking at it slightly differently. Uh, and I've always thought festivals are that way of looking at things differently anyway. So that kind of stuck with me. 
So in Edinburgh, we've got 11 festivals, 11 major festivals. They're all different in scale and in form. Some of them are quite small. Some of them are quite large. Some of them have got a lot of, a lot of staff. Some of them have one member of staff. Some of them are core funded by Arts Council. Uh, some of them have no fund, core funding at all. Uh, it's ticket sales based. So huge range and variation of form and scale. And up until, uh, as you rightly said, David, up until about 2007, uh, they were all operating independently. And they, there was a, a thought at the time that maybe there was something that they could do together because there's a real sense that uh, they were duplicating at times and therefore they were making uh, not the best use of limited resources. So there was a thought that we need to get together. So in 2007, they created their own company called Vessels Edinburgh. It's, it's a private company. The board of directors are the directors of each of the festivals. Okay, so it's separate. There's no outside body sitting on it. It's purely independent. And it's set up to drive the agenda of the festivals. And, and even though the scale is different, I think there's some common issues here that we kind of grappled with. And the first thing was we decided not to do everything together. You know, this is sometimes I think this is what consortia do when they get together. They try to do everything. We immediately said we're only going to do one or two things. We, we didn't have the capacity at the beginning to try and do everything. So we decided we'd try and do one or two things and do it well. And then as things developed and as the consortia started to get to know each other, because that was one of the interesting things at the beginning, these people, they kind of knew each other, but they didn't. So the, the, the very fact that the consortium coming together created a forum, which over the years built respect and trust. And that actually widened the agenda further that they wanted to take on more things as they got to know each other. And that idea then of more things, you might go, well, that's great. If you've got staff, you can take on more things. But actually, it was decided that we, one of the principles of our operation would be that we would have a dispersed leadership. There wouldn't be one person trying to do everything. Actually, each festival would take a lead on behalf of the whole to try and drive forward something that had been agreed on. I'll give you examples in a minute of what I mean. Uh, so there was that dispersed leadership, but there was also this idea of uh, consensus. We would only do something if everybody agreed on it. If one festival objected, we stopped. There's no sense of doing it, we thought, if one festival objects. So that means it had to be consensus. Sometimes that's slow to get things moving, but actually, if you get consensus around one thing, it then can move very quickly. So, so at the very beginning, the things that we came around, and this won't surprise you, was marketing and promotion. That was one that came straight away. You know, how can we make ourselves heard by uh, the tourism authority uh, to help them promote us more effectively? Uh, and you might say, again, surely you didn't have that problem in Edinburgh. Well, I'd suggest to you, if you go away and look at any of the tourists, even to this day, you go away and look at the tourist promotion literature for Scotland, you'll see that you can hardly count the people that are in the pictures because they promote themselves basically on the idea of uh, exclusion. It's a, a place to get away from it all, beautiful scenery. So it's hardly any people. Whereas we, as festivals, we want crowds of people, loads of people enjoying themselves. So there's kind of a mixed message there. So at the beginning, this idea of promotion uh, was one area that we were interested in. For us as well, it was about programming, getting uh, the festivals not to work together on programming, but to try to create a fund to create new work. Uh, so a commissioning fund, essentially. Uh, and again, this doesn't necessarily have to be a commissioning fund driven by the Arts Council because the case can be made to private individuals and companies and trusted foundations to create such a fund as well. Uh, so, so we were interested in these different common agendas. Uh, we had principles and we were uh, using dispersed leadership to try and 
uh, drive the whole thing forward. It's, it's, it's worked very well for us over the last decade, but it hasn't worked all the time. I'll give you an example where it didn't work. Uh, and this might be of interest to the conversation that when we come on to about uh, corporate sponsorship and so forth, is we tried to collectively work around the area of uh, corporate sponsorship, but each vessel felt that there was a, a trading on toes. And so we decided to stop doing it. Uh, at the time, some people felt, oh, we're going to miss an opportunity here. But uh, much more important to the whole sponsorship agenda was our collaboration agenda. And so we decided not to continue with anything with regard to sponsor, joint, joint sponsorship. Uh, at the time, it was difficult. But in retrospect, it, it makes me think that actually good strategy is certainly about sometimes saying no. You got to stop doing certain things. I, I seem to remember somebody once telling me that good strategy is about closing doors. You don't like to do it, but sometimes it's a good thing to do. So our, our whole collaborative infrastructure has been based on this idea of trying to focus in on a common agenda that everybody shares and that everybody can really get behind. Uh, but also this idea of no one festival is leading on everything. We're trying to disperse the leadership and, and not take that kind of Homeric approach. That the leader is always out in front because sometimes for us, leadership can be in the middle and it can be behind pushing. So leadership is in lots of different positions as well. So there's a, there's seem, there's, there's a wonderful, um, uh, I, I suppose it works. It looked, looking at what has happened in Burr and then seeing the operation in Edinburgh, that is, you know, 10, 15 years down the line, you can see this evolution. Um, and I, I think it, it, the idea of, of, of a good strategy you're talking about, I, I, I think a clear strategy is so helpful in knowing whether it's just for your organization, your festival organization or for a consortium organization in knowing what you are and therefore knowing what you're not. So to be able to, that idea of being able to say no. Um, uh, and it's interesting also that both you were talking about that informal network that had all pre-existed a formal network, not dissimilar to, to Burr. So there's, there's some very, very interesting parallels there. Um, but also this idea of trial and error, which Emma was talking about in terms of capacity building, giving them chance to trial something and being able to realize that something is not right. What I'd like to, to turn to though, just uh, um, uh, would be to the financial model that you're using to sustain, because you mentioned it's not just Arts Council funding. Um, and I think when we spoke also, you talked about um, uh, it, it, it being project led so that there are different strands or aspects of work that come within the, the, um, the body that might have a, a time limit on them. Yeah, what the, the basic core principle of the funding model is that each festival provides a small amount of funding based on its turnover, a percentage of its turnover. And that's, that equates to a, a part-time post. That's what its level is, a one part-time post. The rest of the organization then, based on what the common agenda is, needs to identify potential sources of funding to make those projects happen. And when we get the project funding, there's a percentage of that which is project management. And that, that pays for a member of staff to lead that project. I, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples from outside the public sector. Uh, well, actually, actually outside the, the Arts Council sector. Uh, so one of the areas that the vessels increasingly over the last kind of five years have got very interested in is uh, digital. Uh, lots of digital developments happening. Uh, so we actually went to the university sector the further and higher education sector and discussed with them the opportunity to do some joint research projects and joint practical projects uh, in that whole area of digital and data development around the, for the festivals. Uh, given even further education students the opportunity to do work practicing, but to, at the same time developing projects for us. Uh, a research project was created through funding councils in the higher education that then funded some of our project work within the festivals. Uh, and uh, there was a percentage of that that allowed us to employ somebody who 
we called a geek in residence. Uh, you, we all know about writers in residence and musicians in residence. Well, we actually created a geek in residence, uh, which was basically a young developer who could come in and troubleshoot for the festivals around lots of different digital issues. And these weren't simply things like, okay, we've got a problem with our website. Can you fix the content management system? There was a bit of that, but it was actually this person saying, that's what you're doing with your website. If you actually did this, you would look much better. You would reach more people. And actually you could get the media involved in promoting you if you created an application programming interface. I'm not going to get geeky on you. But the idea was they were bringing new thinking into our mix that allowed the festivals to do different things. And again, I think a good festival is a laboratory. You know, it's a laboratory in different ways. You know, in, in, in lots of community or rural settings, it's about bringing things into the table that aren't normally there year round. It's, it's about looking at things differently. It's, a, it's just a laboratory and you can experiment, I think, in lots of different ways, both programmatically but also in the kind of operational and organizational side. So, so we're always looking at these new partnerships that can be formed through the festival and looking beyond the normal idea of the local authority or the arts council. Right. Well, I think that fits very well with the kind of theme of today and working together. And when we get to speaking with Una about uh, the corporate partnerships and relationships um, that, that exist. Just finally, um, a uh, question Carl asked me to ask you, has it helped the festivals grow or, or was that an objective? Okay, so, so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take that in two directions. Just before I do, I, I'm gonna say, I, can't, I cannot use the term stronger together because it, that puts me on one side of the independence debate in Scotland. Uh, so I, I can't do that, okay? That's a big issue here. <laughs> uh, but uh, but it, the, the growth agenda wasn't the key agenda. That wasn't the agenda. It, it has, though, had an incredible effect on the growth of the festivals, both for good and ill. And I'll be totally open with people about this. Uh, the, the last decade of development uh, has been huge. The festivals have grown massively. And that, that is because we've managed to develop all these partnerships. We've in, in, in extended our reach much further. Uh, and so this has brought with it challenges for the city itself uh, because there, it's a small city uh, and it, it, it's the facilities, especially in August, are stretched. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's interesting to note though that even though we are international festivals, the lifeblood of the festivals are the residents of the city. Uh, if they didn't buy the tickets for the shows, we, we would be out of business. So the, it's a core issue, but it, it was not, the, the collaborative experiment was not seen about growth in the first place. It was actually seen about making better use of limited resources in whatever way that might be. So, so sustainability rather than growth. Yeah, yeah. Super. Well, we might come sustainability, but actually, yeah, come back to it, but actually sustainability, but actually resilience might okay. be the word as well that we would use. Okay. Well, we might swing back to you because I, 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 when we're talking about sustainability and the, the sort of uh, ecological issues, um, uh, I think there's particular, uh, they are expanded to some uh, degree in Edinburgh, particularly in, in August. And I'd be very interested just to get a, an insight in that later. But um, thank you very, very much, James. Um, uh, very, very rich. So we're going we're gonna to now uh, uh, cross the Atlantic um, uh, and say good morning to uh, uh, Beatrice Pizarro. Um, and uh, Beatrice is, is, is an actress who's currently playing Donna Alba in the house of Bernarda Alba. And um, uh, so she's on a nighttime schedule. So thanks for getting up earlier. And I'm just going to read a little um, uh, extract from a, a review which says Beatrice Pizarro shines as the play's titular matriarch, delivering a transformative performance that is equal parts terrifying and heartbreaking. So um, uh, uh, that's certainly um, uh, the kind of uh, critical response you, uh, that um, uh, I'd love to see and, and congratulations on that. 
but but today um Beatrice is here not just as a theater maker but as a festival maker because um uh, from my short encounter with Beatrice. Beatrice is, a, uh, is from uh, Colombia, from Latin America, and is an actress and who was living in Toronto and found that the work was quite limited in terms of uh, a non-native speaking Canadian. And the roles I think she mentioned were playing were gangsters, malls and prostitutes. Um, and she comes from, I mean, South America, the theatre tradition is extraordinary and, and um, that work wasn't being shown and the actors of South American heritage and Latin American heritage weren't getting the opportunity to play these roles. So she set up a theatre company in 2008 um, called uh, Alba Theatre Company. Yeah. 2001, Aluna. To, Aluna Theatre yeah. Company in 2001. Which um, and then in 2012 was this when you started your festival. Yeah. So um, I suppose that takes us into our conversation uh, today in in terms of of what was your motivation uh, as a theater maker with a theater company in in establishing a festival, um, the which is the Rutus Festival. Mm -hmm. uh, good. Uh Good afternoon for all of you. Um, I just want to acknowledge that I'm, I'm speaking from Toronto or Takoronto, uh, the tra traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, uh, the Mississauga of the Credit, and the Haudenosaunee. Uh, yes, thank you for that introduction. You know, I don't read reviews, so you just, <laughs> it's like, as an actor, I never read a review. Um, but um, uh, sorry, I have cats all over me. Uh, yes, uh, quite a, an interesting conversation. Thank you so much. I've been taking notes and seeing how I, 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 I may fit in this. I think just to give a little bit of context of Toronto as a city. Um, more than 50% of uh, the population in Toronto is non born in Canada. So we have these gigantic issues about around inclusion and equity. And I think that's where the festival really uh, places uh, itself. Um, as you said, uh, David, uh, I founded the company in 2001 because there was no work for anybody of what I'm calling now a trans-American community. Um, because I felt that if we call ourselves Latinx, we were excluding our black, uh, black people, our uh, indigenous people. So I feel more, I, I like to think of the continent as a whole and that has been the mandate of the company and the festival is about connecting the Americas to Canada through the arts. Um, we are all love the European traditions and, and, uh, and what they have offered uh, to, to the performing arts, but we also have a rich cultures and rich traditions within the continent. And our whole goal was to, to, create, to create that partnership with a real focus on collaborations across the Americas. Uh, pr productions and collaborations, uh, knowledge sharing, uh, that's very important to us. Um, the festival was, first I, I just was looking at other festivals around the world and say, uh -huh, hey, I want to have a festival. And uh, so um, it's, it's more, uh, no, uh, it's, it's a joke. I was looking at specific festivals in Latin America, like uh, at the uh, Candelaria Theater, the Corporación Colombiana, and festivals that were very focused on human rights. And, and not only did they have um, the festival part, but they also conferences and talks around human rights and, and what, was, what is happening in our societies um, was an integral part of the festival. So when we founded the festival in 2012, we're still a very small festival. We um, we are uh, we have a festival every two years, and that was a because economy. We didn't have the money to produce a festival every year. We are primarily a theater company, and we never wanted to lose that. That's you know, being an artist is who we are, and that's that's what makes us move mountains. Um, we also uh, were dealing with bringing to Toronto this. Uh, art that people were not familiar with. And so most of it in another language with subtitles, subtitles. Uh, but it was introducing artists that are not the famous artists in all the festivals around the world, but people that I was looking for groups that were working in very unique, extraordinarily artistic ways to, to talk about uh, human rights. 
So that was also bringing people that nobody knows. So selling that is not easy, trust me. Uh, first of all, they're coming from the Americas who cares about Latin America and people that they have never seen. So uh, that was challenge number one, but uh, you know, challenges are, you know, festivals need to have huge challenges. And, um, but it was a double thing to educate Canadian audiences about what's happening in the rest of the continent in, uh, in the arts but also to educate the communities of all these immigrants that have come and set up home here. And uh, they know very little about the cultures where they came from. So that was the initial, uh, and it, it keeps being our goal. Uh, the festival is growing, but in 2012, we started the festival with like four shows, uh, very small, but with the conference, which has become, if we're talking about partnerships, although we don't have a consortium, um, that's very challenging in Toronto because Toronto is also a city of festivals. So while you're running the festival, there's another 30 festivals and I am not exaggerating because we're all in these silos, you know, like uh, the food festival from, I don't know, from um, this country and this and that. So there's tiny little festivals in a city that unfortunately, I don't think we still struggle a lot with getting people to see the arts. That's a struggle in the city. Uh, I may have my theories about it. We're a country and a city that is, um, has a lot of newcomers, a lot of refugees, a lot of people who are just at the survival level. So, and people who haven't had the time yet to have the money to go and pay for a, for a ticket. So our festival also, um, the most important thing is that we make it available and accessible to people. Um, we, we work a lot all year round with communities to try and bring these communities in for free, whatever we need to do. Um, but the conference, I go back to the conference because universities have become one of our biggest partners. And, um, and this year, as we emerge out of this, uh, well, not out, but as we navigate this new, new way, um, the funding through universities has been an incredible support for us in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. They support the conference. The conference is usually a four-day conference that is organized around the themes of the, of the shows that the festival is presenting. Mm -hmm. This year, we, we, uh, for the next seven years, we have partnered as a community partner in a SHRC grant from York University, which they felt that they really wanted to use our festival to be the encuentro, the encounter place uh, for these uh, conversations to take place. This year, something um, happened that is very exciting as well, is that the Nuit Blanche Festival, which is under a new leadership by uh, uh, quite an important academic and indigenous academic and a powerhouse, um, she also decided to do this conference of across the Americas for, for, for the whole week. New Blanche is only one night, but she extended it across the city and partnered with us to have this conference so that we all can come together and have one conference instead of 10 different conferences. Can, can I inter in interrupt there? Uh, it's fascinating that, that you, you're again talking about partnerships and the importance of partnerships. So I suppose that's something to, 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 to share with the community. Um, and uh, your, your, your commitment to the political is, 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 yes. is something that I didn't mention in my introduction, but that, but that actually is very, I know it's a very strong part of your work, both as a theater maker and as a festival maker. What I'm interested, I suppose, in the context of this conversation here is your decision to choose a biennial. Yes. Um, in Ireland, the majority of festivals almost exclusively are, are annual festivals. That is the tradition, the year comes, the yearly cycle. It goes back to, you know, uh, pre-Christian uh, times when the festivals were an annual, annual uh, happening on an annual basis. In recent year, we've had two festivals that have chosen to, um, to change from being annual to biannual. And I'm interested to, to hear why you chose biannual um, and whether you feel that, you know, that, that, it, that it was, you know, are there disadvantages of being biannual and what are the advantages of being biannual? Yeah, as I said before, I chose it only because I didn't have the money to produce a festival every year. <laughs> you know, our funding, like, 
the festival falls under our core funding uh, from the from the Canada Council, the Toronto Arts Council, the Ontario Arts mm -hmm. Council. So they all put it under our core funding, right? So our operating funding. So that makes it very very challenging. But I tell you uh, what it did for us. Uh, uh, um, um, a festival and a community that is about building community is that what we did in the what we do in the off year festival is we do a festival of works in progress. So that is is with the goal that making that many of these projects will eventually make it to the big festival because producing in Canada is also extremely expensive and very challenging. Most productions get their three week run and they die after that. People don't have independent artists don't have the money to remount those productions. We don't have a strong tradition of, of collect of, of ensembles. So there are no theaters with an ensemble that, that you say, okay, we want this show from you and they can put it up. So that becomes an issue for touring for Canadian shows. Uh, I mean, the, the shows that tour are shows that come from companies that have a lot of support and a lot of money, but the independent artists are left behind. So the Caminos Festival, which is in the off year of Rutas, is, is being designed, it, it was founded in 2015. It was designed to that, specifically that. And, and what is so beautiful is this year, for the first time, we have four shows that are coming out of, of the Caminos Festival. It has taken this much time to now be able to present these shows of local artists alongside uh, international artists. So that's something that has worked very well for us. Um, so just just so, to, to, yeah. to, to reiterate that, for, so, so after running Rutas Festival twice, yeah. as a biannual, you then established a second festival in the off years, yes, which exactly. is, is a more modest uh, yes. festival in that it looking at work in progress, yes. so that it's a feeder festival for the big international festival. So you do have, you end up running a festival each year, but that they have an alternative, yes. alternative yes. focus. And so it allows us to maintain for such a small organization, it allows us to maintain a presence for the sponsors. Sponsorships and uh, for a company like us, which is very politically committed, is an issue. You know, I have had uh, mining companies come to me, we will fund your festival. I go, no, no, because you're destroying my country. So I cannot take money from you and say that I can, you know, feature you as a sponsor in my festival, right? So, so that's where, where, who do we take money from is very important to us, extremely important. There's an issue also with, um, in talking about, I think James was talking about sharing and decided not to share sponsors or, or I'm not sure whether it was Emma, but if a bank here gives you money to a festival, the other festival, you know, uh, if you're partnering with another festival, then they cannot get the same sponsorship. So it becomes there, there are those issues. I think it has worked really well for us having it every two years. It allows us to build, having the complementary festival keeps us in the minds of people, which is the most difficult thing for a festival to maintain. It's, you know, people are looking forward to that festival. The thing is in Toronto, you have 50 festivals you're look, looking forward to in, in, in three months, right? So it's not a signature, we don't have a signature festival that is like for many cities, let's say Santiago Amil in Santiago, that's the festival of the city. So people know and they go, uh, David Americano in Bogota used to be that, you know? So, so here you're competing and I hate to use the word, but there's just too many things, too many, many, many things, mm -hmm. which is fantastic. Uh, but it makes it more challenging for a festival to become a signature event for a city. Mm. And, uh, and so for us, it works really well. It gives me the time to really go around the world and choose shows that are not the same shows that every festival presents, but really have the opportunity to sit down with people, make collaborations and partnerships. Mm -hmm. In the next five years, with, through the partnership with, the, with York University, we are hoping to produce five shows within the mm -hmm. next five years, which are international collaborations mm -hmm. between Canada and the Americas. Well, so just like in Ireland um, uh, and here, while we don't have 30 festivals happening at the same time, there is a festival, the festival um, ecology is full. Um, um, so it's, it's just, I think that's why I was, I was delighted you were able to join us and share with us that, um, uh, something of your um, 
your political agenda, which I think is really, really important for us to hear. I was at two minds whether or not to invite you next week when we're talking about <laughs> equality, diversity and inclusion, um, because I think the example of how you've worked in, in, in Toronto has been inspiring. So we might be able to swing back, but I want to turn now to Uno O'Donovan. Um, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, um, uh, Una is joining us today in place of, of, of uh, Mary O'Kennedy. Um, and Una has worked for five years, uh, worked for five years in London and New York with such uh, esteemed uh, organizations as the Royal Court and Donmar Warehouse in London and the Public Theatre in London. Um, and uh, following on from uh, Beatrice, uh, Una is also a graduate of uh, Trinity College Theatre Studies, so um, would be well aware of the demands of uh, playing Donna Alba and then getting up next morning to talk about festivals. So Mary, we invited Mary along because Mary, uh, or sorry, Una along because uh, uh, Mary O'Kennedy consultants are involved in the RAISE program with the Arts Council. Um, I mean, it's, it's a corporate consulting firm whose clients are the Arts Council and IMA, so very much working at a very large scale uh, with large scale organizations and um, recognizing that the organizations here today, many of them are one person or small committees working at a local level. So we have a, we're, we're, we're we, we just, um, Una and I yesterday discussed this disparity and how, um, but also rate the, the, um, uh, the, her, she, Una has been working with the RAISE program, which the Arts Council support uh, arts organizations to develop their um, corporate uh, relationships with, with, with sponsors and uh, corporate donors. And in my conversation, both with Mary and with Una, I was learning about how this has, this, this territory is changing. And again, like the idea of consortia, and, and as, as Beatrice was mentioning in terms of collaborating with the university, this idea of collaboration is coming more to the fore. So um, that's really to pass the floor over to you, Una, and, and to, to give us an idea, having listened to our conversations there about how you, uh, think the festivals can benefit from this uh, changing uh, corporate landscape. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, David, and thank you so much for having me here today. I have taken scribbling so many notes um, that have been so interesting and insightful. And I think maybe the first thing I might come back to is just on Beatrice's point, when you talked about that potential mining partner, you said that doesn't align with your values. That's a really key part of partnership at the moment, particularly as it relates to corporate partnerships and philanthropy. It's that values alignment piece and how you work and how you, you know, what are your operate operationally, how are you aligned together? Um, I think that's a really important part around when we think about partnerships, it's due diligence and ethics and reputation, but that's kind of maybe further down the line. And a funny example of that is you might be aware that at BP uh, are we're sponsors of the Science Museum in the UK and recently sponsored uh, an exhibition around climate change. So you can see there, there's something, there's, there's something afoot in terms of that values alignment piece. Um, but speaking today about, you know, stronger together and that real focus on partnership, you're talking about how festivals are responding to that changing nature of society and thinking about collaboration and collaboration isn't just within the festivals that you have, it's within your wider stakeholders. So it's when those partners, those potential funders, those in-kind partners, and how you can really work together to create. And we really are moving away from the word sponsorship. It really is into mutually beneficial partnerships. Um, some other really interesting points I kind of come to, Emma, when you spoke about the consortium and Burr. One thing that we've noticed, and I think it's a brilliant point, because James, you had a different opinion that, you know, philanthropy really likes partnership in Ireland in the Irish context right and we've also seen how success can breed success and I know James you spoke about in you know festivals Edinburgh you were looking at like how could we build this kind of fund that was built from um, different uh, you know foundations and corporate partners but there was a bit of competition within that and being really clear that you know you can't be all things to all people and for you collaboration was more important than that sponsor piece just as an example, recently, um, one of our strategic funders, which is the Community Foundation for Ireland, you might be aware they had the Toy Show appeal. That was an amazing appeal. It was raised over six million euro, and that was distributed to children's focused char uh, charities um, uh, all over Ireland. Uh, part of the, the remit of that was in applications. So 
collaboration was actually encouraged between um, organizations, so between arts charities and festivals, where impact is substantially increased for the beneficiaries. So something to think about. Um, I'll just give you a bit of context within the RAISE program. So RAISE is an initiative uh, aimed to build organizational capacity, to generate new private investments. So we work with arts councils, strategic organizations to see how they can fill those partnerships with businesses, how they can build partnerships with individuals and how they can engage with trust and foundations. So a key focus of the program is looking at how we can assist organizations to build those robust funding models. And when you're looking at exploring festival models that might be biannual or consortium, I think this is a very interesting way to think about how you are also thinking strategically we did an event last year called Philanthropy in the Arts, and we welcomed, interestingly, uh, a number of those strategic funders. So we had the Ireland Funds, you might know of them. We had Rethink Ireland, we had Business to Arts, and we had the Community Foundation for Ireland. And one thing that really stood out to me was something that Denise Charlton said. This is the Chief Exec of the Community Foundation for Ireland. Funders are interested in engaging with organisations that are looking at projects and programmes and festivals that are long-term in their thinking, in strategic in their approach, and sustainable in their delivery. And that's sustainable coming from the environmental side, and I know we'll go back to James on that later, but that's sustainable in how the model and delivery of that piece. So something I wanted to touch about there. I totally acknowledge that the bridge organizations I'm talking to today in the call are small festivals operating on part-time staff, you know, one or two people or whatever that might be. So thinking about those bigger partnerships and how you might engage in that way, just don't have the resource for that. But it's thinking about the language of sponsorship that's now really moved into partnership, okay? And how we've really noticed that working in the RAISE program and working with arts organizations for the last number of years. So those days of organization, or, you know, of those businesses that might be in your local community, writing those sponsorship checks to support your arts festival, they're, they're changing, right? If you hold those relationships still, happy days, might make sure in mind and cultivate those really important people. But we've noticed that there's a real shift coming, particularly from the corporate space, and that's around that partnership model. The language is now focused on value alignment, mutually beneficial, impact driven, tailored to business needs. And again, it's strategic, right? So in the past where those marketing budgets existed, where you could have a title sponsor of a particular storytelling festival you might have in West Cork or whatever that might be. It's changing now because businesses have to think more strategically. And that is because the evolution of something called um, ESG. So you may have heard about this. It's um, ESG stands for Environment, Social and Governance. Um, I'm just going to ask David just to pop in a, a short PDF that I created. You can look at it at your leisure. Um, but it just details what ESG actually means, okay? So I know at the moment festivals are looking at how, you know, ethically and socially responsible principles that you're thinking about in terms of, you know, climate, uh, you know, climate neutrality and climate action. But within this document here, I want to actually focus on the S side of this. So this is the social side of things. And this is where you can actually deliver on impact. So. There's three pillars of ESG, environmental, social, and governance. So environmental, if you're looking at the document, says how an organization interacts with and impacts its surrounding environment. Social, how it interacts with society. And governance is how it manages its governance. So on the next slide, you do have that open, you'll just see a really helpful kind of um, just um, table there, which breaks it down. So the environmental side is really around climate action. It's about climate neutrality. It's around ethical sourcing. It's around recycling. It's really around the climate side of things. Whereas the social is looking at diversity and inclusion, LGBTQ rights, racial discrimination, and how you are dealing with those in the projects, programs, and festivals that you're running. It was interesting, you know, Beatrice, this is why you started or you wanted to run your festival because you, you notice this massive gap in terms of equality and inclusion. And now, particularly for corporate Ireland and international, you know, multinationals, they really need to be looking at kind of that space and how they're engaging really meaningfully. And it's moving away from greenwashing 
and whitewashing, and it's being really focused on impact and impact focused partnerships. So very top line ESG, it's that evaluation of organizations collective consciousness, and it's embracing responsible business. So ESG, it's, it's really critical to communities and the organizations that you work with. And a really brilliant thing is that nonprofits and arts festivals are experts in social impact. This is what you do, working closely with your communities that you serve. You can deliver on that S piece of ESG and businesses need to align in that way to be able to deliver on their impact reporting. And this is literally like an EU directive. ESG companies will need to be thinking about this and reporting back on this. So it's no longer what used to be called corporate social responsibility. That was a nice to have. You might know about that where businesses, chunk of their profits will be given back to a charity in the arts space, it could be education, it could be sport. It's now much more strategic in that thinking. I've also just popped in that document, just a few examples of those ESG focused partnerships. You have example, the Future Limericks Festival, and that's being funded by the ESB Brighter Futures Fund. And that's about promoting awareness of climate change to inspire positive action in communities. Another example is uh, from a RAISE organization that we work with, it's Children's Books Ireland, and they partner with KPMG around a project called Free To Be Me. And this project showcases the richness and diversity of modern Irish society. So it's partnerships and it's, it's businesses saying that we want our partnerships to be reflective of the world that we live in today. And we want them to be much more meaningful and much more engaging with the organizations that we work with. There's two other examples in there. Vodafone and how they're working with High Digital. This is a really interesting partnership because it's a skills training program around digital literacy for older people and it's in partnership with Alone and Active Retirement. But this is also an opportunity for Vodafone to say how do we ensure digital connectivity for the entire gamut of Irish society because they're essentially still their, their, their stakeholders and their, and their customers. They created this program because they want to ensure that everyone is connected, young, old, you know what I mean? And then finally, just on the AIB and their investment in sustainability in UCC, that's very much focused around sustainability and the environmental side of things, but they have an ambition for delivering sustainable pro pro profits. So it's all about doing good business, doing better business, but having to do that because they're literally being measured on it now. Do you want me to stop, David, and you can come and take any questions or? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm. Well, I, I don't know about everybody else, but um, my my head is full. It's it's, <laughs> it's pounding with um, uh, and it's I, I I I felt that there was a disparity with our speakers today, but you've wonderfully connected with each other, which um, is very inspiring. Um, I mean, <clears throat> what I'm writing down here is 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 values. Is that clarity of what your organization values are. And, and from a number of speakers, the clarity of messaging as to what what that what those values are, um, and that idea of long term thinking, which which um, uh, which is all about strategic and and um, while uh, brings us back to that beginning, the demand that is that organ or arts organisations are under small arts or arts organisations face in terms of um, be having that clarity where 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 before it was less critical to have that it is becoming more critical um and but i think what's evident is that if that clarity is there these other relationships with universities like beatrice's or with with different funding opportunities that emma spoke about once you have that strategy in place you were able to you you, you were able to <clears throat> get funding and it it, it 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 must lead towards a more sustainable future and i know myself from sponsorship that when you went into a, a corporate organization firstly you had to change your language now you're talking about how that language has changed since my day which is i'm, I'm, I'm a little i'm a little out of that world but how how recognizing what the language is um but it, it just does just, just bring us this, this, this question of, and before we open up the floor, we're running a little bit late, but we, we have scheduled until five o'clock. So we will, we're, we're, we're not gonna be running away. I just wanna come back to James. Um, the question of when we were setting up these panel discussions, we, Carl and I spoke about the um, uh, ecological responsibility 
and how, how this is something that I think in our private lives, most of us are involved in, but, um, and, and collect as organizations, we would have some idea about some, most organizations would be making efforts in terms of not printing as much and, 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 and thinking about that, but that as yet it has, it has, it has not come on, on stream as a, as a policy directive from the Arts Council and as a need, but it is likely to come down the line. So I'm just going to turn to, to, to James because I believe that that is one area that the Festival Consortia Festivals Edinburgh was able to assist uh, the festival sector in Edinburgh to start thinking. Yeah, uh, so yeah, so in, I suppose one of the reasons why we grabbed it was we knew that artists were interested in, in climate change as a concept for the creative process. Audiences were increasingly becoming interested in supporting organizations that th they saw as responsible. And we knew that legislation would be coming down the road. And rather than being pulled by the legislation, we thought we would get out in front and try and lead in the right direction. Uh, so there was a bit of self-enlightened interest in this. Uh, so so the, fir the first thing we did was actually, we got together with all the venues that take part in the festivals. And we just said, what can we do uh, to make each of the venues more green, you know, at a very basic level. And we then gave them a kite mark, uh, the green venue initiative it was called. It was just a little green thing that they could stick up in their uh, venues to show that they were taking it seriously. And from that grew a huge amount of stuff because obviously it's a big agenda for government and for trust and foundations and for universities. And so actually we, again, we, we worked with the theater sector and the visual arts sector to then create a new company called Creative Carbon Scotland. And Creative Carbon Scotland, which has been over in Ireland and done some work in Galway, and you know, it, it's essentially trying to start with the basics for every organization. It's trying to say, what is your carbon footprint and how can you minimize that? Identifying, therefore, what are the factors that are in your control that you can minimize impact and then what are the factors in your influence that you can influence influence others' behavior? So we're coming at it from that dual focus of power to change and influence for others to change. Uh, and so just last October, and I'll put a, a, a link in the, in the chat, we brought out a document called the Vessels Tackling Climate Change, just proposing some of the things that we're going to be doing uh, and also in the spirit of experimentation that we talked about earlier is, you know, how can the festival environment be a place where experiments can take place? So just this summer gone, we replaced uh, with some of our events, diesel generators with hydrogen generators uh, in a partnership funded through Scottish government uh, to try and experiment to see what the future would, could be. Because again, a good festival as we think is, it should be looking about the future. Mm. Uh, so I'll put that up, but it's, it, it was incremental. We didn't try, again, we didn't try to do everything straight away. We started off small, created that sense of trust and that sense of community, and then it grew and grew and grew. Mm. Th thank you very much, James. Um, that, that, I think you've, you've provided a great inspiration for us and, and within a context that, that um, uh, of festival making um, that can be scaled to where we're at as a, as a, as a nation and as a, as a sector. And Carl has put up a note in the chat there that um, the Arts Council has a climate action working group that the festivals is part of um, and, uh, and, and, and that festivals will, you know, this is coming down the line, the need to have some festival policy, but it doesn't, I, I, the idea of getting out and ahead sounds like a really good idea. That, uh, that way festivals can lead the agenda rather than uh, be, be forced to follow it. And there's James Link. So um, I'm gonna kind of turn to the floor now. I, 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 please, if you want to, if you'd like to speak, put up your hand. I see there's a message from D uh, Burkett from uh, Circus 250 there. Um, and it, it's sort of, it's swinging back to you, Una, in relation to, to rural festivals. And I think this was part of our conversation as well. 
is is um, it's difficult to entice corporate support and partnership outside of large populations. So, um, I mean, th th that idea that's how can smaller organizations, whether they be in rural areas or small towns and villages, how can they use that knowledge? Absolutely. Um, uh, Dee, I was just typing an answer there, so delighted to answer this uh, over, over um, voice. Uh, just as well to put it into context, I think it's important to understand where we exist within the sector. Um, because it's all well and good to say, yeah, go out and start talking to people and building partnerships, just in terms of how people actually give, uh, in terms of charitable giving, uh, arts and culture amounts to about 6% of the giving. So the majority of that is going to homeless societies, which is about 56%, and medical is following after that about 40 something. So, you know, just to give a bit of context, like it is a very competitive market, I completely understand that. And when you are a regional organisation, it is very hard to entice those you know, multinationals who are based in Dublin or those nationally based organizations, I completely understand that. A few steps I might I might share uh, or a few suggestions is firstly, look in before looking out. So who on your festival development board, your advisory board, your committee can help you create any inroads to existing businesses in the local area. So that might be a credit union with a local branch or an AIB with, or, you know, if there's professional services, financial services, who or where already is that contact, like that, that contact there? It's all well and good to do quite a lot of research, but I'd maybe task you to look at maybe five. And if your board can help you with that introduction as a door opener, that's the best place to start. Following that, do a little bit of research about, are they operating in the space? Do they have what they might call corporate social responsibility pillars, or are they looking at that ESG strategic? Like as an example, this is a bigger organization, but Zurich. Zurich Insurance are uh, interested in educate, um, addressing educational inequality. So social mobility is a really big priority for them. Do you have projects and programs that speak to something like that? Similarly, look at what those that business and what they've done in the past and how they've engaged. It might be, you know, not necessarily in the space of arts and culture. It could be sports and community. Are any of the projects and programs that you are delivering aligning with that? And then the next thing I do is reach out, engage with them, and do not send an email saying, I'd love to have a conversation with you about sponsorship. You send an email saying, I would love to have a conversation with you to see how we can work together in partnership to deliver on mutually, you know, mutual aims to improve and enhance our community. Because if you say, I'd love to have a conversation with you about a partnership, no one's going to turn you away. But when you say the word sponsorship, no, I have no budget. I can't do that. It's just, you know, but if you start to build that relationship and see where do your values align, how can we actually really target it and how we're working with the local community? That's much better way to start building on those conversations. They're probably where I might say you could start. Hope that might help. Um, I think the the um, the uh, I think one of the keys there is is your board though or your committee and having people who can open the door. I was mentioning yesterday we had um, I, I saw um, um, the CFO of a local um, multinational in Clonmel dancing at one of the gigs I had put on a, an African gig actually. And I, I thought like that was a foolish mood on his part because he demonstrated his, his involvement. And actually he turned out to be very happy to come on the board of the festival and was a key person in opening doors. So having those aides to help you inside the door, the, um, I think can be, can be really, really helpful. And also as we discussed yesterday, making a decision about how much time to invest in this based on, on, on um, because it, it is time consuming. It's, it is, a, um, uh, and, and time is very precious. Um, David, can I jump in there as well, just with a quick thing? Please do. It's just this idea that it, sometimes you might want to go to either a corporate sponsor or a wealthy individual with a specific ask, but sometimes it's good to go in with an open mind and listen to what they're interested in, and then quickly, adjust your ask and one of the the classic examples for me was when i used to work in liverpool uh, i remember going in to meet the the chairman of everton football club i'm not going to talk about football okay but i noticed that on his wall was a children's drawing and i just asked him in passing about it and it turned out it was from a children's charity that he supported uh, and it was one of his most prized possessions because a child had drawn it for him. And, you know, it was an incredible story. 
I had been going in and ask it with a mind to ask him to sponsor a classical music concert. And I switched to think about our community education program. And he, he immediately went for it. So again, it's this idea that we should be listening sometimes, not just talking about ourselves. Mm. Very good. Can I add, yes. Can I add something? Uh, yeah. Coming from a very small festival, from it's not easy for uh, diversity, you know, for people of color to get sponsorship either. That may be changing now, but it's not been the case to fund such organizations. So relying on your own community and what the festival can do. What events do you have in the festival that are dedicated, given a platform to your community? Really do. In, in the last two years, I've been including for people like, for uh, for young audiences, you know, so that you bring so suddenly schools began to come, you know, and bring all these parents and all, you know. So I have a community meal. Um, I have a day specially that is just for the community to present their shows, like uh, you know, like community theater. It's a day for them on a Sunday. So it is dedicating uh, because the power of people. People are also investment. You know, they will come and buy a ticket. You know, sponsorships. It's great to have the big thing, but for me, it's more important that people come and see the festival. So, how much you do you really make a space for that community? Not going and asking them to buy a ticket, but actually the festival committing to to showcase that community in, in some ways. Indeed, thank you, thank you, Beatrice. Um, so. We've done a lot of talking. Um, is there anybody else who'd like to take the floor who might like to comment or share some ideas or indeed ask a question? I, sorry, David, I have one last thing to say on the partnership side of things is that there is immense value in in-kind partnerships and those contra partnerships that you, I'm sure within your local community can, can develop. So it's not always about how can we get the money and how can we get that in the bank? It's thinking about as well, how can you share, you know, the resources and how you can build a really great and strong partnership in that way as well. It's just, a, I think um, it's when actually in the RAISE program, we didn't ever um, uh, report back on it, but it's huge in terms of the, sponsor, the partnership, the support that's been given to reduce a budget. So that's, a, I think as well for small organizations to think in that way too. Well, I, I've always, um, I mean, Within the Arts Council, we do ask for festivals or all arts organizations to to give an, um, to uh, calculate the in-kind contribution in the community. And I often think for many festivals, they underestimate how much contribution, how much value there is, both in terms of the making availability of space or 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 um, or, or people. Um, we have. I do see there was a question earlier on from uh, Grace in relation to um, consortia and can a consortia festival um, be with festivals not Arts Council funded? Um, yes, I think if <clears throat> if there are is <clears throat> excuse me some Arts Council, uh, I, I don't think it needs to be an Arts Council funded festival to get funding under the under uh, capacity building support scheme. But certainly not all of the festivals would need to be Arts Council funded. It would probably be helpful if some of a consortia were Arts Council related. And certainly there would need to be a strong focus on uh, the arts within the general um, uh, work that is being focused on. Uh, but again, not necessarily exclusively the arts. Indeed, a, a, a very quiet. There's also a question there for you, Emma, in relation to um, the uh, capacity building funding. You did touch upon it in how did the capacity building funding uh, help? Um, what did they fund? The question is. Oh, okay, yes, I see that there now. Um, yeah, the capacity building, we have two um, as a consortia. One of them was the projects coordinator. So that was um, a, a role to bring in column to look at business development, um, what else, volunteer strategy, uh, funding applications, that sort of thing, or look at different ways in which we can um, 
lever funding, not just to public funding, but private as well. Um, and then the marketing and marketing um, was a second one that we we worked on. I think that was the previous year. Uh, there might have been a there certainly has been a lap over time in years and the way things have actually happened COVID delayed some things but yeah so um i suppose uh to to i i kind of th i i think certainly there's capacity building support scheme um webinar tomorrow if i'm right thursday i think there's something on so uh definitely you know a collective our model isn't a copy and paste to go into another town, but it's definitely potential that there's a model there to be used as local arts development tool. Um, and uh, certainly I see the capacity building support scheme certainly would be um, an ideal way of uh, inquiring, investigating what would work, because definitely I would certainly wholeheartedly say having a third party there to help facilitate, to tease out what do you want? your individual festival and really interesting and the way James, you know, spoke about each individual, I really liked that James, that each individual festival um, takes a lead on a project on behalf of all the others. Um, and that, you know, that's working on behalf of each other, still working together. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think the, the CBSS would be an ideal tool. And, and to ob that. obviously the next challenge for uh, a consortia is that mm. longer term sustainability yeah. And how, how will you go forward um, uh, now? Obviously, the festivals Edinburgh has provided one model in terms of um, each of the organizations contributing to maintain this sort of base level administration on which can be built with different funding models. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, invite Christina Quill to to join us. Um, I believe you have a question. Hi, yeah, I was just uh, thinking, now I came in late and I don't know if you talked about this already, so apologies for that, but uh, I'm looking at events now at the moment as a whole and, you know, applying for various things. And um, one thing that occurred to me is like, safety is a big thing now at the moment. Like, you know, I Irish festivals, I think are saturated now more than ever. And we're saturated with this kind of, you know, uh, juxtapose with the fact that people don't want to go out as much, you know? And one of the major issues that I was looking into that I, f I found through my own research is that safety is a key, key factor. And um, I'm wondering, is there, is there any uh, specific things put in place to kind of um, allow for us to bring in better safety measures into festivals going forward? Mm, well, that's a, a that's a very interesting question, very big question, um, Christine, because uh, I think we were all faced with um, you know, as I mentioned in my introduction, health and safety has always been one of the key elements that festivals in their preparation have had to look after. But with the advent of, of COVID, it, it multiplied the challenges in relation to that. Um, and interestingly, just prior to um, us opening the chat room, um, my, myself and the panel were discussing the challenges festivals are now gonna face in terms of uh, the vulnerability of the artists to illness in the year coming ahead. And that, that's something that um, uh, you, 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 where we might expect a small drop in audiences on our booking related to, um, because of COVID um, uh, illnesses, uh, what, what becomes much more problematic in this context is going to be um, uh, the artists. Uh, and I already know some festivals have faced that. So I think that's just in terms of this year's challenges, that's a big one. In terms of providing a bigger um, uh, support to festivals, um, James, would you have any um, response in that? Is it what, what might they have done over in, in Edinburgh? It's a, it's a, a big issue currently and we noticed that there's actually a demographic divide between old and young essentially obviously health comes into this uh, you know a lot but generally there's a split between younger ones who are happy to jump in the mosh pit uh, right away and older ones who are are more hesitant about going out into events so a couple of the things which we are considering at the moment and one of them which we've already done is we've created specific spaces and places for events which will remain socially distanced and will remain masked. 
so for to give you an example, we run the Art House Cinema in Edinburgh, and all performances before five o'clock will remain socially distant and masked. Everything after five o'clock, it's open to whatever it used to be. And this is this the idea here is is trying to create spaces and places where people feel comfortable. Because I think the key issue here that we've all got to be doing is reassurance. You know, this is about trying to assure and reassure people that we are looking after their health. Uh, we, it's still very virulent out there. Uh, and I, before this, we were talking about the fact that we're currently running our science festival and speakers have had to drop out because they've got COVID. So one of the things we're talking about at the minute is creating different bubbles for front of house and back of house so that people don't mix so that we're, we've got this whole issue. So that's a slightly different one than the audience. That's about the putting on the shows themselves. Because if we lose some of the key performers, well, then we've lost the whole show. Uh, so it's actually trying to think of how we can uh, ensure the show goes on, but also create these, these spaces Welcome and places that this people can feel service. comfortable. This train calls Somebody's on the train from Connolly, I think, yeah. Uh, but we, we, you know, we've got uh, our, our websites are continually changing and providing all the advice and guidance up to the minute. Uh, we're trying to minimize, you know, we, we will keep all the, uh, the liquids available for people to clean their hands. We will create all those spaces. We will be trying to ensure that there is still this sense that we're looking after you. Thank, thank you, James. Uh, I mean, the challenge, uh, Christine, we, we probably face is the scale. Again, you know, going back to very my introduction in the scale of and range of festivals across Ireland. Um, and uh, there were efforts certainly made last year to provide a blueprint for festivals in terms of safety. Um, but the, 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 for a very small operation, it becomes very, very difficult. Um, again, I, I think working collaboratively with other festivals and linking with other festivals, and, and this brings us back to the, the consortia idea, um, uh, has great, um, there has great benefits in that. And I, I don't know that any festival maker will not pick up the phone, will not answer the phone to colleagues in terms of sharing that knowledge. David, can, can I jump in again? In terms of this collaborative infrastructure, one of the things I didn't mention that we've done also in Edinburgh is we, we've got a festivals consortia but we thought that there's a lot of people with an interest in the festivals that should be talking together all the time as well. So we've created a kind of a parallel consortia, which is all the stakeholders. So the local council, the university or further education college, if it exists, the, uh, the local TD in the case of Ireland, uh, if there's an economic development agency, that in a, in a forum that meets quarterly, and the festivals bring issues to them so that they can see whether there's an opportunity. And that to me is where, if there was a message around safety or health, and, you know, these issues could be brought to the table. So it might be that within each county or within each, you know, major urban area or whatever, th there could be a stakeholder collaboration as well as the festivals themselves. Indeed. Well, um, uh, it, it, it goes to, um, I, I suppose I'm very envious of the um, work that has been undertaken by this uh, consortia in Edinburgh. And I think it shows um, uh, the example of what can be done of uh, working together. Um, at the moment, I don't see any other, uh, any other call to questions. Um, we still we're, we're, we're on uh, we've we've passed the 90 minute mark so um, I will start it was still open if anybody wants to say anything um, I would start to draw it to a close however um, <clears throat> Connor how are you down in Watford good to see you again David um, yeah it, it was just just to make a general comment uh, and it, it's um, you know, I'm an arts officer, obviously, and uh, the arts office, the arts office, or the arts service can't fund everything, can't can fund fuck all at times. Now, to be honest, but the thing though is that the arts officers in your in your various areas are always interested to know what's going on, and they may have other supports 
that can help festivals, you know. Um, at the moment, I was, I was just counting. I, I, I'm on the board of 11 festivals here in Waterford, uh, mainly in the city. And um, But the thing, though, is it's just to try and keep those festivals going, which was why I was very, very interested in this talk and the cons consortia um, collaboration um, kind of area as well. But do do speak to your local arts officers. Don't don't necessarily go and looking for support. I mean, take a leaf out of uh, what James was saying. You know, you may see something in the office that that makes you think. Hold on a second. They're in interested in that. Could we maybe work something on that? And whether you end up getting a loan of thirty chairs or end up coming out with a couple of thousand, you know, it's it's all winnable. You know, so it, it's just a comment. You know, and uh, and it's a great. This is a great meeting as well. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Connor. Well, I, 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 as I did mention there, um, Melanie, a, a fellow arts officer in County Tipperary, you like to join us? Yes, hi, David, and thanks for the invitation and thanks to the speakers today because, as you said, your head is full, mine is absolutely full of great, um, just some of the ideas and uh, ways in which people have responded. And just maybe to pick up on Connor's comment there. Um, I suppose one of the things that came out of pandemic in Tipperary, and as you know, David, living here, it's a very big county, you know, it's kind of more than two hours from one side to the other, was uh, we started bringing all the festival uh, organisers together. And all we did really was host the Zoom uh, in from March 2020, when all of a sudden people were going, how are we going to manage this? And what we did was kind of invite everyone to come together and for us all to share our thoughts. Um, and it was really about us helping each other to figure our way through this. And so that started, I suppose, in 2020. And we did it, you know, three or four times in 2020 and continued again in, in 21. And what was interesting for me, I suppose, out of that was uh, towards the end of last year, when we, when we consulted with the sector, it was one of the things that they really wanted to keep us, for us to keep doing. Um, and so from what I was getting from a lot of your speakers today was, you know, that idea, I love James's visual of festivals looking at things slightly differently and being in a laboratory. And Beatrice was talking about a space for community. And I think Una talked about us being, festivals being experts in social impact. So I think bringing all of that experience into the room can be really beneficial. So um, it was really just to pick up on the, some of the supports can be non-monetary as well. Um, and maybe to thank, you, thank all of your speakers and everyone for a really fascinating discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Um, I, I think that's a very good point to sort of start heading out the door. Uh, two hours on Zoom is a long, long time. Um, uh, because you're talking about being stronger together, which was the theme today. And that stronger together, yes, funding is important, but uh, collegiality and other supports are also integral to that. And, and uh, just as in Waterford, and there's a note there from William Hammond in relation to um, the, the fact that in Cork, there is also a forum. So these forum, these, these, these um, uh, uh, consortia are one way, working with your local arts officers, working with um, uh, corporate interests or philanthropic interests in your neighborhood. Um, and also just looking at, at the model you're using. I mean, we are talking about sustainability and that, <clears throat> that model of having your festival every year might, might not be relevant now and, and being having the courage to question um keep constantly questioning um but i think that the key themes that i've come away with today are in terms of values uh, clarity of values clarity of message and and that commitment to the long term uh which which is encompassed within a strategic um uh, uh thinking um so we move on next week to the the uh um issue of uh, quality, diversity, and inclusion. Um, I think we have some extraordinary speakers. Uh, it should be a very dynamic um, uh, session. Um, this is an area that it has been forefronted by the Arts Council in recent years with the publication of the quality, diversity, and inclusion um, document. But it's reflecting huge changes in Ireland in relation to the, the, the demographics of Ireland um, and uh, 
Personally, I believe that festivals can play a really, really important role in furthering um, a greater uh, understanding of equality, diversity and inclusion because it is this experimental space, because there are different permissions that prevail during festival time. So um, uh, it is our last session for this uh, in, in this period. Um, there is a commitment towards uh, change makers and the conference where we can all come together in person. Um, it, that is likely to be in spring, 20, in early 2023, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, so uh, this ongoing commitment by the Arts Council Festival team to working with you, to supporting you in whatever way we can, um, because we recognize the enormous importance of the work you're doing around the country. Um, and we, I hope um, that today was useful. But just finally, I'd like to give a really big thanks to Beatrice and Emma and James and Una for deputizing at the last minute, um, because uh, for a very rich session. And um, uh, thank you all. We will see you next week, I hope.